Gomez, Risk Management Consultant at Antum Risk. We will now begin recording. Continuing education units, today's program has been approved for one CEU through the South Carolina Nurses Association. You must participate in today's webinar in its entirety and also complete the evaluation in order to be eligible to receive these credits. Antum Risk is an approved provider for nursing continuing professional development by the South Carolina Nurses Association and accredited approver by the American Nurses Credentialing Center's Commission on Accreditation. Uh, a conflict of interest occurs when an individual has an opportunity to affect educational content about health care products or services of a commercial interest with which he or she has a financial relationship. The planners and presenters of this CNE activity have disclosed any relevant financial relationship with any commercial interest pertaining to this activity. Antum Risk has conflict of interest disclosures on file for all presenters and planners. Uh, provision of this education activity by Antum Risk does not imply endorsement by SCNA or ANCC of any commercial products displayed in conjunction with this activity. SCNA gratefully acknowledges the support of companies to support the presentations of speakers. Commercial support does not influence the design and scientific objectivity of any SCNA educational activity. Today's learning objectives will be to articulate what GHS stands for and how it relates to the OSHA standards, list the exposure pathways and give an example of each, and identify the GHS pictograms and articulate their meaning. Now, let me turn this over to Tamara and she will get us started. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you guys so much for, for joining us today for our webinar. I hope you guys are having a really great Tuesday. Um, I'm not going to keep the camera on the whole time <laughs> because I can't stand watching myself teach, uh, but I, trust me, I'm here, I promise. Um, if you have any questions, as Wendy said, she'll be monitoring the chat. Please raise your hand. I'll also leave time for questions at the end. All right, so without further ado, as Wendy stated, our learning objectives uh, are that by the end of the webinar, you'll be able to articulate what GHS stands for and how it relates to OSHA standards. You're going to be able to list the different exposure pathways and give an example of each, and you're going to be able to identify the GHS pictograms and articulate their meaning. So as we are, are beginning today, we need to make sure that we are all on the same page. So what kind of hazards are we communicating about under the heading of hazard communication? This webinar is titled Hazard Communication in Healthcare. So what kind of hazards are we communicating about? Well, ideally, we are talking about hazardous chemicals, and that's what we will be focused on for the duration of this webinar. This is what hazard communication means from an employee health and safety point of view. We are always discussing hazardous chemicals. OSHA addresses hazardous chemicals in the workplace through its hazard communication standard, uh, which is 1910-1200. And that integrates GHS. And I mentioned in our learning objectives that we would uh, be able to articulate what GHS stands for. And you'll see on your slide here, it stands for the Global Harmonization System. So this is exactly as the name indicates, this is a worldwide agreement between a number of countries about how we are going to handle, distribute, package, label chemicals so that if a chemical is coming from Italy or from the United States, we are all operating with the same set of definitions, the same set of pictograms so that we can really communicate effectively about those hazards uh, associated with that chemical. We'll talk more about it shortly, um, but let me uh, start the subject by saying I hope that everyone in this webinar and lots of other employees can tell me what these nine symbols mean. We'll definitely know it by the end of the class today, but hopefully you already know. Again, on getting us all on the same page, let's work on our definition of what is a hazardous chemical. 
And a chemical means any substance or mixture of substances for our purposes. And we'll dive deeper into this definition in a little bit, but a hazardous chemical is any chemical which is classified as being or having a physical hazard, a health hazard, is a simple asphyxiant, a combustible dust, a pyrophoric gas, or a hazard that is not otherwise classified. So now that we have our frame of reference that we're talking about hazardous chemicals and what hazardous chemicals means, are there hazardous chemicals of concern in healthcare? I hope I can hear everybody at home uh, nodding their heads in agreement. Yes, there are absolutely hazardous chemicals of concern in healthcare. ANA has addressed it in multiple areas, but uh, essentially primarily it was through this 2006 document, Nursing Practice Chemical Exposure and the Right to Know. You'll hear that term again in a little bit. NIOSH dedicates a whole section of hazardous drug exposures in healthcare. Uh, OSHA has their e-tool for hospitals, and this is part of it in healthcare-wide hazards. Hazardous Chemicals, again, has its own section. And there's a really great research paper that was published by PSR, which is Physicians for Social Responsibility, ANA, and HCWH, which is Healthcare Without Harm, all regarding hazardous chemicals in healthcare. And they did some monitoring of, of a variety of individuals, and it was um, really eye-opening about what kinds of chemicals uh, we interact with and retain. <laughs> so this is definitely something that is of concern. Chemicals are everywhere, for sure. But are hazardous chemicals everywhere? Well, yes, frankly, a lot. And, and we get very used to them, whether it's in our job, in our lives, whatever. We miss hazards, especially hazardous chemicals that are right in front of us. So uh article is getting a little bit of age on it from 2004 but this is uh showing miss williamson who was worried about the effect of <laughs> jackhammers or the sound of jackhammers rather on her unborn child i understand that i mean we're always uh gonna focus on the new things that are in our environment but is just from this photo, does Miss Williamson have a chemical that is more hazardous to her baby immediately than the sound of those jackhammers? It is hard to see it's pixelated. Uh, Miss Williamson is pregnant, of course, and she is smoking. So she's used to the smoking, right? She's done it repeatedly, per potentially for a, a long period of time. She's not thinking about the cigarettes in terms of hazardous chemicals and the exposure of those chemicals uh, for the fetus being exposed to those chemicals. She's concerned about that new thing in her, her environment, that noise, that, that thing that's gonna catch all of her attention when really we need to focus on, on the cigarette and the chemicals contained therein. And so in healthcare, where are we gonna see these hazardous chemicals? Well, you're of course gonna see them when you're treating patients. We have a variety of anesthetic gases, dialysis infusions, a whole category of antineoplastic drugs, casting materials are all different areas when treatment that you may come upon hazardous chemicals. Additionally, cleaning, disinfecting, and sterilizing surfaces. These are just a couple of examples of chemicals that you'll use in that process. Tissue fixatives, this again, a couple of examples of different tissue fixatives that are available. Uh, formaldehyde, of course, is uh, a cancer causing agent. Um, and this is the stuff that you're gonna have on site and that you know that you're gonna have on site. This doesn't even count what could come into your organization through the emergency department. And I would encourage any of our hospital emergency managers to meet with local emergency management officials, 
and potentially large employers that are in your area that have industrial operations that could produce chemical exposures for their employees in an emergency that would then follow and come to the hospital. It helps you be prepared. These chemical exposures, and I'm going to give you examples of, we're all internal. So this isn't something that someone has brought through the ED. This is something has has gone sideways within our the walls of our hospital. So this is a Riverside Hospital was dealing with uh, an evacuation because of a xylene release in their histology lab. They use that as a, a tissue fixative for tissue samples. And they said, the article said that it was a negligible spill <laughs> but that it required the evacuation of the entire histology wing of the hospital uh, and also included treatment for three employees. I think we can all agree that if our organization is in the news in reference to a chemical release, that is probably not the direction we wanted our day to go. So these are all newspaper articles. This is another uh, Oklahoma City hospital. It was a VA this time. There was a quarter of a gallon of an acid-based cleaner that was used for disinfection that spilled and uh, resulted in the evaluation of seven employees through the ED. And they were later released, which is great. Um, no long-term effects, it doesn't appear, but still, that's a quarter of a gallon. That's not a lot. Then we have one from Denver, a hospital uh, was involved in this in 2009. It involved the evacuation of 500 people and the treatment of 45. There was a, a pool recreation area, wellness kind of rehab area within the hospital, and they mi accidentally mixed hydrochloric acid and sodium hypochlorite. And because of a tunnel system and the way the hospital connected to another community center and some other things, it traveled through the tunnel system and required the evacuation of multiple buildings. New Hampshire Hospital, um, the primary source they believe was the inpatient operating room, a uh, chemical of some kind was released. They suspected that it was anesthesia gas, but by the time the fire department got there, their gas meters weren't able to tell them exactly what the issue was. Um, it did necessitate the evacuation of the emergency department and the OR. Uh, both were closed for a week while they were investigating. 19 employees became ill. 12 were transported to another hospital because, of course, the ED was closed at theirs now, and some were held overnight for observation. If this happens at a facility, God forbid, do you think that OSHA is going to come and pay you a visit? I can strongly suggest that the answer will be yes. <laughs> this would, if nothing else, would be considered a referral by media in most uh, areas, and I would um, count on OSHA visiting. So uh, we definitely want to try and avoid these things if at all possible for lots of reasons. So a reminder about our definition. We're going to dig into this a little bit more. Again, a chemical is any substance or mixture of substances, and it's going to have or be a physical hazard, a health hazard, a simple asphyxiant. We're going to get into physical and health hazards in greater detail because there's some additional examples that go with those. But a simple asphyxiant. What is the hazard associated with a simple asphyxiant? Can somebody tell me in the chat? What will a simple asphyxiant do to you as a person? Lack of oxygen. Exactly right. Uh, so it will choke you out, it will cause you to pass out, things like that, things that we do not want to occur, right? And now how about combustible dust? What is the hazard associated with combustible dust? What will happen? So with combustible dust, exactly right, Mr. Stewart, things go boom, and usually they go boom, boom. 
boom, there are multiple uh, explosions in series often uh, with combustible dust explosions. Our pyrophoric gases. What are our pyrophoric gases? This is like really nerdy stuff. If you guys know this, this one's a hard one. So a pyrophoric gas has the ability to essentially auto ignite at a certain temperature. It depends on the, the substance, what the set off temperature is, but this would be good information to have, particularly in reference to the storage of chemicals, right? We would like to know if things are gonna go boom on their own, just from where they're stored. Uh, and then we have our hazards that are not otherwise classified. This is an expansion category. My understanding is that um, this still has not been used yet. When the GHS standard went into effect in 2016, um, this was part of it. They were actually forward thinking, knowing that when the last hazard communication standard was passed a decade before this one, <laughs> the GHS standard was, was integrated, things changed, right? New chemicals were developed, a whole new kinds of things were, were developed. We began having nanoparticles and using those in an industrial setting in much greater numbers. So they recognized that they needed to leave an expansion category for dealing with hazardous chemicals that didn't exist yet, but um, so that's great that they have this expansion category that'll allow it to grow a little bit. So our physical hazards. Uh, physical hazards arise when the use of a chemical is potentially dangerous due to the possibility of an explosion, a fire, a violent reaction with other chemicals, or potentially a high pressure release. Um, it's, these chemicals are going to be likely to burn or support a fire. They could explode. Um, and in some cases, they can spontaneously react on their own. These are pretty easily determined um, because they produce really large, <laughs> easy to see, dangerous situations. So these aren't, aren't really uh, difficult to get our hands around in terms of what, what we're gonna do with those when they're on our site because they're, they're so um, prominent. The, the focus on, is, is so prominent on them. So these are five of our GHS, Globally Harmonized Pictograms, that are, are trying to communicate with us about the hazards, the physical hazards associated with chemicals. Can anybody tell me in the chat what the pictogram on the left, this one, what is this one trying to tell you? Yep, this one is an explosion. Very good, boom, I like it. That's exactly right. How about next? We're gonna go down the row. Good, very good, fire. The next one is is a little difficult, right? I love it. OSHA spent, you know, 10 years working on nine symbols and they got two of them to look substantially similar from a distance. <laughs> Mr. Burden's right. That's an oxidizer. Fire department is particularly interested in those. Uh, next, this one's a little difficult. Um, Keep in mind when I talked about things being released from a high pressure situation that it can be a physical hazard. Very good, Mr. Stewart. Uh, that's a pressurized gas. And then the one on the right is the only symbol that they have that does double duty. So the physical hazard associated with it is on the left side of this pictogram. And this is focusing on the fact that whatever this chemical is, is corrosive to metals. So. Very good, you guys did a great job with those. Thanks for, for participating. Some more examples of our physical hazards. These are flammables, explosives, our oxidizers, our gases under pressure, our self-reactives, self-heating, water reactives, organic peroxides, metal corrosives, and our pyrophoric liquids and solids. Again, these are the big things that go boom. Now, um, 
just to, to put a word of warning out there, the next slide when I'm going to go to it, there's going to be a gross picture. So if you don't want to see, now is the time to look away. Um, and once I am done covering uh, the material associated with it, I'll be sure to cover the picture up. But I just wanted to give you a warning that, that it is coming. So these are negative results of, of physical hazards. Just to get this out of the way, this was a high pressure release of a chemical that impacted the employee's eye. Is there a particular type of personal protective equipment that might have helped with this situation? What could this employee have done differently or the employer have done differently? Absolutely right. Goggles or a face shield would have been really helpful here, right? Um, and we're looking for goggles more than safety glasses because with chemicals, we're concerned about um, a liquid going down and goggles are going to create that nice seal around the eyes. So when, usually when we're talking about chemicals, we're wanting to make sure that we have goggles. We would want to be sure that they are impact rated like our Z84 because if we're worried about things coming out at a high pressure, then the impact rating on traditional safety glasses will be very helpful. So let me cover. All right. Now the gross picture is covered up. You can look back at it if you want to. So uh, this one, just a little funny. Haha. -ha, Thog makes the discovery that methane gas is explosive. You'll notice uh, the back end of a woolly mammoth here with the fire. And then on the bottom right hand side, this is a uh, floor stripper situation. Floor stripper plus static electricity equaled a boom. Um, I like it that the guys in the back are in uniform. I think of our military as being the experts in things that go boom. So for them to have had this, this small issue, I find a little humorous, so long as, as no one was injured, of course. So after our physical hazards, then we have our health hazards um, is our next big category that we're going to get into in a little more detail. So these are the things that make the news. <laughs> uh, these are the chemicals with acute health effects. This is where a lot of the news stories go when there's a chemical release. Um, Health hazards are associated with chemicals that may produce negative acute or chronic health effects. This photo is a picture of Graniteville. I'm not sure how familiar you guys might be with Graniteville, but this was a train wreck and derailment that happened in the middle of the night, uh, essentially through uh, the center of town. Um, and one of the rail cars that was uh, attached was a chlorine uh, car and the chlorine cloud traveled along the ground, killing six employees at a nearby plant, as well as a number of other individuals. They were actually quite fortunate that this happened when it did in the time of day that it did versus during the middle of the day because there's a school right next to where this train derailed. So that could have been absolutely catastrophic. But I would encourage you to look up information about Graniteville. The employees at that nearby facility, that wasn't their chemical and not something that they worked with, but potentially would have been good to include that in their emergency plan since they knew that they were so proximate to the rail yard and the uh, types of chemicals that the train carried were, were known. There's manifest for that. So. That would have been a, a good thing to expand your emergency management program to cover. So some examples of health hazards. Here's our four pictograms for GHS that are trying to communicate about specific health hazards. These are going to cover things like reproductive toxins, specific organ toxicity. If you see that something is a nephrotoxin, that's going to go after your kidneys, uh, neurotoxin, central nervous system, depressant. You're going to get that kind of information through these symbols, uh, carcinogens, acutely toxic things, and then down to things that are just potentially an irritant. Um, this is my favorite symbol of the nine. Uh, I, I call it my something weird, but we'll get into that in just a second. 
So let's go back to the chat and somebody tell me what the skull and crossbones is symbolizing in this context. It either means poison, as Mr. Stewart says, or pirates, right? <laughs> so uh, if it's on a chemical at the workplace, clearly we're going to talk about that it's uh, poison. And I told you that this next symbol is doing double duty. So if the left side of it was that we were, uh, the chemical is corrosive to metal, the right side, the health side is telling you that it is corrosive to what? This one's corrosive to skin, right? It would, Marley, if you breathed it in, it would potentially be corrosive to, to the lungs as well. Corrosive is corrosive, right? So it's saying that it's corrosive to tissues. So that that's uh, not incorrect there. And then that next one is the one that I told you I lovingly call my something weird. So this is the uh, symbol that lets you know that the chemical has some hazards that are just a little different. It's going to be the indicator for skin sensitizers, rep, uh, respiratory sensitizers, irritations. Um, not going to be indicative of the serious eye damage, mutagens, none of that kind of stuff. This is, is going to be your notice that there's something different going on with this chemical. So if you see the exclamation point on it, I would, of course, really encourage you to read that label. And then the last one, what is it trying to tell you? Far right, respiratory irritant. I like that, Marley. So that's one uh, thing that this is telling you. Terrence, you're right. This is harmful health hazard. So this is about things on the inside. So this is where you're going to see specific organ toxicity, um, inhalation hazards, things like that are going to be covered by this symbol that loosely looks like a person with with the starburst in the chest. Does everybody feel pretty comfortable with the different GHS symbols that we've gone over so far? We've covered eight of the nine. So kind of the, the quintessential definitive event when you look up health disasters, chemical disasters, what comes up is information about Bhopal. Um, this occurred on December 3rd, 1984 at a Union Carbide pesticide plant. They, of course, given the nature, it's pesticide. You can imagine they work with really gnarly stuff, right? And uh, in this particular case, there was an exothermic reaction in a 42 ton tank operated at the Union Carbide plant in the middle of the night. It actually started on the second and then continued. They continued to try and battle it into the third. Uh, this exothermic reaction was vented in the tank, which normally that would be a good thing. And I guess it really kind of is still a good thing. It's either going to be vented or it's going to explode. Um, the bad thing is that when it started venting, that three of the safety systems, engineered safety systems, failed. Uh, there was no guidance provided or warning for the community. Uh, my understanding is that there was one really low siren uh, and it was mostly helpful to the workers, did not help with anybody in the surrounding areas. And the plant was in a particularly dense area that had a lot of housing very proximate to it. And the bulk of the housing that surrounded the plant was uh, impoverished. So not good seals, no doors, no windows, no no really good way to try and prevent a chemical from getting into their space, even if they had had the warning. Uh, their only option really would have been to flee, but they didn't even get that warning. Uh, 3,000 plus people died on December 3rd. There was another 8,000 by the end of that week who died from the exposure to the pesticide. 
And then the long-term estimate is between 15 and 20,000 people were uh, killed as a result of this Bhopal disaster. So this is an acute exposure uh, to a chemical. This would be an acute effect. So this is a short-term exposure. I love this picture. It's from the Marine Corps. The guy on the left has not yet done his pepper spray training, and the guy on the right has. This is the same person. <laughs> so this is what I always think of when I think of acute health effects. It's a large amount of a chemical in a short period of time, and you have a nearly immediate reaction. Technically, it can go up to 12 hours past the initial exposure and it still be considered an acute effect. Typically, it does not take that long. Usually, it's within two hours of the event. Uh, the reaction will be, uh, it will affect your smell, you're going to sneeze, cough, runny nose, tearing of the eyes, uh, all of those, all of those good things are associated with acute effects. Then we have our chronic health effects. So this is a long-term exposure of a small amount of a chemical over a long period of time. The reaction to this is extremely delayed. So this is really difficult for employers to deal with and manage. Industrial hygienists uh, focus on chronic health effects a lot. Um, that's what air monitoring does, uh, permissible exposure limit tables, PEL tables in the OSHA standards, ACGIH tables, um, all give us an indicator about how long an employee can be exposed to a particular hazardous chemical without suffering negative health effects, both acute and chronic. Asbestos is something that often pops to mind when we talk about chronic health effects. You've been uh, couch surfing anytime recently, you know, middle of the day, you may see some ads for mesothelioma, which is a type of cancer that is only associated with asbestos exposure. Um, because of the delayed nature of these reactions, it's very difficult uh, to get your handle on. I love this set of, of slides. On the left, we have healthy lung tissue. The photo in the middle is a 90-year-old school teacher. And on the right-hand side, we have a 40-year-old miner. So in mining, they get a health effect that, that has a particular name. Can anybody tell me what the health effect that is so well-known in the coal industry is? Got some folks typing. Black lung, exactly right. And this is exactly what it looks like. You can see why it got the name, right? It literally turns the lungs black. So that is another example of a chronic health effect. And Marley, you're absolutely right. Synergistic effect with chemical exposure for smokers, they're, they're putting their hands up to their mouth continually while they're smoking and it's heated and the chemical exposure that goes along with smoking is just an exponential increase in the hazard. Great, so um, the article talked about how eventually the lungs become so scarred and damaged that they're unable to function. Um, but as you can imagine, as that lung function decreases, the impact on the heart is considerable. So in addition to causing the problems with the lung, it, of course, directly results uh, in an enlarged heart and heart function issues as well. As we're talking about uh, chemicals and their exposure, let's make sure we all are talking about the same kinds of exposure. So exposure in this context is when an employee is subjected in the course of their employment to a chemical that is a hazardous chemical, and this includes potential exposure. Remember, exposures in healthcare can occur in the process of dispensing medication too medication counts as a drug or as a chemical, excuse me. And so we need to make sure that our, 
our bedside staff not only knows what signs and symptoms to look for after a patient is provided medication that they've dispensed, but they need to be aware of what they should be looking for in themselves or in their colleagues who are dispensing medications. What long and short term health effects may handling this particular medication um, cause? So we need to make sure that, that we're including our clinical staff in these discussions because, again, medications are chemicals and potentially hazardous chemicals. Our exposure pathways, we have ingestion, inhalation, absorption, and puncture. Uh, inhalation is by far the most common pathway. Uh, it makes perfect sense to me. I don't know about you guys. I enjoy breathing. I do it more than I do anything else in my day. So uh, makes sense that this is the most common pathway. Ingestion by adults is typically uh, suicide, but it can happen as accidentally at work. I'm aware of two separate cases at South Carolina OSHA that involved ingestion. Absorption is often a PPE failure. We've chosen the wrong kind of glove for the application, the wrong kind of apron for the application. Um, and puncture is due to the high rate of pressure release in my experience. For example, um, a hydraulic line that is opened but is under pressure. Uh, as that hydraulic line is cracked, a small amount of the chemical comes out the side and, and can impact uh, the hands. So often that, that's the, the case for, for puncture, it's stuff under high pressure. In 1983, the Department of Labor under OSHA created their hazard communication standard, which was also called the right to know standard, and it required that employers provide information to their employees about the hazardous chemicals that they work with, and they have to be given that information prior to being exposed to them. There's five parts to this, a written plan, a chemical inventory, labels and warnings, training, of course, always, and then SDS. And we'll talk about what SDS stands for in just a second. So how are we going to develop our chemical inventory? I'd go to the people who are paying the bills. Uh, nobody's going to bring a chemical uh, to work out of the that they're using for a work purpose out of the goodness of their own heart. Somebody is going to have paid for it at some point. So referencing those purchasing records works well. Conducting a walk around inspection of materials uh, is another good way to make sure we have a comprehensive list and then reviewing our work practices and methods again through observation helps you build that list. When GHS went into effect, they did shift the name of the sheets that carry all of the hazard information for a particular chemical. As soon as everybody knew what an MSDS was, they changed it. <laughs> so now they're safety data sheets. And safety data sheets under the GHS system are um, all now laid out exactly the same. Again, this is the benefit of the globally harmonized system in that if the chemical is coming from here or say from from Italy or you know China, whatever, it's going to have on the safety data sheet the information in the same categories in the same order. SDS, MSDS is used to have the same information was required in an MSDS as, in, as is required in an SDS. The big change is the layout uh, and done so that we can communicate more effectively, standardization of the information. So again, you may find things in more than one area of a safety data sheet, but you are always going to find data in certain sections. So if I wanted to know what kind of gloves I needed to use when I was working with a particular chemical, what section would I go to on my SDS? What do you think? Section eight, exactly right. Um, all of that information is going to be in there. It's good to know these first aid measures too. However, under GHS, the need for safety data sheets has kind of gone away. We'll talk about that in just a minute when we get into our labeling. Some basics about our safety data sheets. They are required for all hazardous chemicals. They must be readily accessible. 
Be careful about using computer systems only. A question that likes to be asked is what happens if the power goes out? Now, my hospitals are usually in good stead when the power goes out because they have to have backups for lots and lots of reasons that are much more important than a safety data sheet. But um, make sure that you know what's going to happen if, right? What happens if the power goes out? What happens if the computer system goes down? What happens if the phone system goes down? Uh, things like that, if we're not going to use hard copies. We do have to maintain safety data sheets for 30 years after we stop using something. Again, you know, we learn continuously over time and the things that we now know are bad for us, we may not have known 15 years ago. So that's why it's important that we keep those safety data sheets for 30 years so that we know what employees were exposed to. The other thing that it can do is it can help insulate an employer as well. If an employee comes back and says, hey, I was exposed to this chemical at your facility when I worked there for five years, and you have all your SDSs, and you can show that, no, they didn't work with that, or the chemical that they worked with did not have that component that was um, hazardous, you can help uh, prove that you didn't cause that exposure for that employee as well. So what do you think? Do we need to keep SDSs for household products that we use at work like Windex and Clorox? What do you guys think? Do we got to keep those? Do we have to have them? So the OSHA answer is it depends, <laughs> right? That's always OSHA's answer. So what does it depend on? Well, in this case, it depends on the quantity and the use. So if I have a household cleaner in a quantity in excess of what someone would have at home. So at home, I might have, say, <laughs> two gallons of bleach, one for cleaning, one for laundry. I'm not going to have a case of bleach at my house. So if your establishment has a case of bleach, you would need a safety data sheet for that bleach. Um, use. Use is not really an off-label use, we'll be using it the same way. It may just be a change in frequency. So for example, Windex. Uh, I might use Windex, say, once a week to wipe down my mirrors and do some windows and things like that. Are there people at work who may use Windex on a much more consistent and continual basis? The answer is yes, right? Our EVS environmental groups are often going to be using glass cleaners for the same purpose, right? They're wiping down mirrors, they're wiping down windows. However, they're doing it with a much increased use beyond what I would use it at home. So if we have a quantity in excess or if we use it differently or in excess of what we would use it at home, we would need to have a safety data sheet. All right, let's talk about labels a little bit. Um, labels themselves can be quite hazardous, as is the case with this one. Not sure if you guys can see that. Most hazardous label ever. Uh, under GHS, things changed. Who remembers this lovely guy? This is what was used everywhere for the longest time, right? And it's still in use. Nothing says that you cannot use this. GHS simply says you have to use our pictograms. You can still use this also. So this was in place forever, for 50, 11 years. So who can tell me which area indicates that something has a health hazard? Tell me a color. I got my fire folks in here. Health is blue. Very good. Right. Health is blue. Fire is red. And uh, reactivity is yellow. And then we have our specific hazard information at the bottom. So that would be a variety of symbols. Anybody happen to know what that symbol indicates? I know I have some fire folks in the group, so I'm sure you guys can tell me. No water. Does the fire department care about that? Absolutely, they do, right? And 
we did pretty good on knowing the different colors associated with things, but what about the numbers? You see three for a health hazard, a four for a fire hazard, two for reactivity. So how much worse is a four than a three? One worse? Is a four a good thing or a bad thing? What's the scale? So you can see kind of the questions that come up when we're using the NFPA fire diamond because we're trying to communicate with somebody quickly at, at a glance, right? That's the purpose of, of this diamond and being so prominent on things. Right. But if we don't know what all of these symbols mean, it's not doing a great job of communicating with us. So GHS came up with their pictograms. Now we've already gone over them a little bit. There's nine pictograms. OSHA enforces all but one, which is that one at the bottom. So let's go over these again. Remind me what's going on here. What is this symbol talking to me about? It's the one with our starburst in the chest. I see people typing, good, health hazards, exactly right. And how about next to it? What do we got going on here? Great, we've got fire and flammables. And then we have our something weird, right, which they call exclamation mark. We have our compressed gas cylinder. Then we have our corrosives. What's next, guys? What's this one? Explosive, very good. And our oxidizers, which is our flame over circle symbol. And finally, what's our last? symbol trying to tell us. Pirate, I like it, exactly right. Pirate or poison. <laughs> so the one that OSHA does not uh, enforce is the environmental uh, pictogram. OSHA does not, as an organization, really care about the swimmy fish unless the employees are interacting with the swimmy fish, right? <laughs> so um, not that not, not a whole lot to say uh, about environmental stuff from OSHA. Pictograms also had to be standardized as part of GHS. They had to have, they always have to have red borders. They always have to be on a white background. You cannot give, a manufacturer cannot put a blank pictogram on something. This is not a fill in the blank activity, okay? Labels have changed. Remember I said that the need for safety data sheets had really diminished under the uh, GHS standards, and that's because they've really pumped up what happens in labels. So some of it's the same. We still have to have our uh, product name on there. We have to identify who we got it from. These are new. Here's our hazard pictogram. So what are the hazards associated with the chemical on the screen? Can somebody tell me what those two pictograms are? Folks are typing. So this is our flammable and our something weird, right? So in addition to that, under GHS, you have to provide a signal word. You have two options. You have danger and you have warning. Which one is worse? Danger is worse. Danger is more serious, right? And those are your two options in terms of that labeling. Then we're going to have our hazard statement. It's going to tell you the high hazard stuff associated with that particular chemical, and it's going to be right there on your label. It has to be. It's included. And your precautionary information. This is going to talk to you about what to do under a first aid uh, issue, special um, PPE information will all be on the label now, which is awesome. We can't just think about chemicals uh, as they sit by themselves. We can pay attention to all the pictogram labels that we want, but if we don't pay attention how things, uh, one thing may affect another, we can have a massive problem. Do we have a problem if we are mixing ammonia and chlorine? And the fast answer is yes. <laughs> it's considered a weapon of war, it's called phosgene gas. So 
we need to make sure not only that we know the hazards associated with the chemical itself, but what does it not play nicely with. Additional labeling requirements. Uh, labels on incoming containers cannot be removed or defaced unless they are immediately replaced. They have to be prominently displayed. They are required under GHS to be in English. They may be in other languages as well, but they must be in English. Comes up sometimes, do we have to have uh, our portable container labeled, our secondary container? And this is one that sadly GHS did not fix. Under the OSHA standard, technically, it does not need to be labeled under very specific circumstances. Is it a good idea to ever not label a secondary container? It is never a good idea to not label something. You always want the label. So this is one where the, the standard kind of lets you down a little bit, but your best practice as an employer is going to say, absolutely, you must put a label on. So some funny labels. Oops. We do have to read the labels. It's important. Uh, this is medication for Parker, who's a dog, and they are really concerned because that medication may cause drowsiness um, and that Parker the dog should use care when operating their car or dangerous machinery. Otherwise, it's fine to give Parker a six pack in your keys, but don't do it when <laughs> he's on this medication as well. When do we need to do hazard communication training? Do we need to do it when somebody first starts? when we're putting new uh, physical health hazard chemicals in place or both? The answer is, of course, both, absolutely. And we need to make sure in our HASCOM training that everybody knows the basics, right? Everybody should be able to answer where your safety data sheets are, how they get access to them, what your current labeling system means if it's something different than what is uh, standard under GHS. What operations and areas um, in their workspace utilize hazardous chemicals? And how they should protect themselves from those chemicals. All right, that brings us all the way to the end. We have just a few minutes left. What questions do you guys have? Well, everybody's quiet in the chat now. Chat's pretty quiet now. Pretty quiet. <laughs> all right, guys. Well, I'm glad that um, we've covered all of the material. If you think of something later that you'd like to ask, or if you're not comfortable talking about it in the chat, you are welcome to reach out to myself or Wendy. We'd be happy to help you with this information. You'll notice in the chat is a link to the evaluation. We would appreciate it very much if you would fill it out. Again, if you're going to want CNEs, you're going to need to fill it out in order for us to be able to give those to you. And if nobody has any questions, I think that's it for me. How about you, Wendy? Nothing else. Just a reminder to fill out the survey. Please let us know how we're doing. Let us know if you have you in if you have any topics that you'd like to suggest that we provide coming uh, coming up, we do have other webinars. Uh, the next one is May 19th and it's on respiratory programs. So please watch for that information and we look forward to seeing you then. Thanks for your time, everybody. Have a great day.